Today we're going to talk about a toolbox. No, not this toolbox, this one. A toolbox for brain research, looking at organs on chips, organoids and microscopy, and why you should be excited about them. And why should you care? Well, the other week now, a whole series of articles came out regarding potential fabrication of data in many papers on Alzheimer's disease, resulting in millions of dollars misspent and misdirecting scientific advancement. Alzheimer's is an age-associated neurodegenerative disease that still lacks an effective cure, and so it was not surprising to see these articles cause quite a stir. Now, I was going to make a video just on that, but this mini commentary only seems to scratch the surface of all the potential misconduct and data fabrication, and also conflicts of interest with companies, and frankly, I wasn't the best person to discuss that. But even misconduct aside, with this enigmatic, complex disease, even careful experiments done in good faith can fail to replicate, leading to dead ends and unexpected setbacks. So, as with Alzheimer's disease, we still don't know how to treat many different neurodegenerative diseases. We don't fully understand the cause. We don't know how personalised it is, how genetics affect things. We can't just take a biopsy of brains of healthy people, cell lines lack complexity, and mouse models have been scrutinised as not representing the full process of disease manifestation, resulting in poor translatability to human therapeutics. So, in this video, I thought I would put my optimistic hat on and provide you with an overview of the three novel methods being employed that will help to act as better models for brains to advance neuroscience research. Advanced number one, organ on a chip. These are miniature tissues grown inside microfluidic chips, about the size of a USB stick. By coupling biology with microtechnology, you have these chips that have little channels in them where miniature tissues reside. The idea is that they better mimic human physiology because they use human cells and you can control the microenvironment. This is important because the ultimate goal is to mimic aspects of human pathophysiology and disease. And while these technologies have been about for around a decade now, it takes time for the technology to mature. You have to validate it and optimise the conditions. And so it's only been more recently that we've seen it possible to do brain on chips. These can be used for basic research or for testing drugs and drug development of neurodegenerative diseases. For example, one company, Emulate Bio, is using their brain chip to research mechanisms of neuroinflammation and evaluate therapeutics. Their brain chip has five cell types, including neuronal cells, glial cells, and endothelial blood-brain barrier cells. So this could also potentially be used to understand how drugs can cross the blood-brain barrier. There are of course limitations, and that includes the fact that this approach is quite technically complex and requires specialised equipment. Plus, the small channels used in the chips can cause shear stress on the cells, and the material that is commonly used, PDMS, apparently can absorb proteins that can then leach later at uncontrolled rates. That said, I think this technology is super cool and obviously goes way beyond just neuroscience and with different organs and chips can be applied in many different research areas. So I think I'll definitely have to make a deeper dive video sometime soon. So that brings us on to advanced number two, brain organoids. Now, brain organoids arguably sound similar to brain on chips, but they are in fact very different. Brain organoids are three-dimensional human brain cultures. One way you can achieve this is by taking some stem cells and directing them to differentiate into different brain tissues. And so you can therefore use them to study human brain development and function. There are a variety of ways you can go about generating these organoids, and generally they can be split into two self-explanatory subsets, directed and non-directed methods. The latter, non-directed method, referring to how you keep things spontaneous. The idea that you just embed the cells in suspension or in a matrix, but otherwise give the cells freedom to give rise to cell diversity and form complex cell-cell interactions. Obviously, it wouldn't be wise for it to be fully spontaneous, because as an experimentalist, you want your model to provide enough reproducibility or to resemble something we would see in our bodies. So this is one of the limitations. How can we be certain we're actually seeing physiological cell interactions? But the reason I mention brain organoids is due to some exciting research coming out more recently. 
To go back to what I was saying at the beginning of this video, neurodegenerative disorders have been challenging to model in vitro owing to their late onset, but a more recent study developed 3D human neural cultures carrying Alzheimer's disease-related mutations and showed that they recapitulated both beta amyloid and tau pathology. What the latest and greatest take this one step further, brain assembloids, controlled assembly or 3D brain cultures. Here, you make region-specific organoids and fuse them, creating a modular system, enabling researchers to probe more complex cell-cell interactions and to generate circuits from parts and ask specific disease-related questions. For example, this 2020 paper generated a functional human 3D corticomotor assembloid by connecting organoids mimicking the brain cortex, the spinal cord and muscle. And in this model, they could actually see it function. And so therefore, this model could be really important for understanding diseases like Parkinson's or Huntington's. So like with the brain on chips, the advantages of these organoids include overcoming the issues with doing experiments in a 2D dish format, where the cells are on a hard plastic surface. 3D cultures rely instead upon genetically encoded self-organisation principles to form structures that resemble in vivo tissues. Another perhaps surprising benefit is that these brain organoids allow long-term culture, so we're talking here months to years, so longer-term processes can be studied, such as maturation of the central nervous system. But brain development is just one application, and the other of course being disease modelling. And so this brings us to advance number three, expansion microscopy, which, as hinted at by the name, it involves expansion. And so I think you're all familiar with the concept of microscopy. And so expansion microscopy is where instead of just zooming in with larger lenses and magnifying the sample, you instead expand the sample, whether that be a tissue or cell, and you do so isotropically facilitating super resolution imaging. This is achieved by introducing a polymer network into a cellular or tissue sample and physically expanding the polymer using chemical reactions. The technique was formally introduced in a 2015 article pioneered by Ed Boyden and others at MIT. In this article, they show off some of the uses of expansion microscopy. For example, this figure you see now is of fixed mouse brain tissue and compares before and after the expansion technique, before being on the left and after on the right. And you can see the resolution is much greater following expansion. You can even distinguish the architecture of the synapse, the site of electrical communication between two neurons. The blue protein here showing bassoon, a presynaptic protein, and in red, a postsynaptic protein, HOMA1. Further enhancements may be achieved with expansion microscopy by altering the properties of the polymer used for the expansion. So exciting times are indeed ahead for neuroscience research. As Ed Boyden says, it's becoming clear that the expansion process will reveal many new biological discoveries. If biologists and clinicians have been studying a protein in the brain or another biological specimen, and they're labelling it in the regular way, they might be missing entire categories of phenomena. You can see this more clearly in a paper that came out this year, where they used an iterative version of expansion microscopy to achieve expansion refeeling. In this paper, they describe how you can see amyloid nanoclusters in brain tissue from a mouse model of Alzheimer's disease. This can be achieved because the expansion causes molecular decrowding, giving access for antibodies to binds. The expansion approach here shows these periodic clusters of amyloid beta, while the pre-expansion staining only detects large plaque centres. So, all models are wrong, but some are useful. This famous quote by George Box is a timely reminder to not be pessimistic, but to remember that some models are indeed useful, as long as they provide testable predictions. By knowing the advantages and disadvantages of your model with correctly controlled experimental design, all you can then do is follow the data and use that to guide your next experimental question. For these reasons, it becomes hard to predict the timescale for when we are likely to see some of these new tools and techniques translate into therapeutics, but they for sure will reveal some new understanding into the brain. And in fact, we've only spoken about three advances here, and the fourth bonus technology I chose not to mention are brain-machine interfaces, because I made a video on this previously. So with that, I hope you've enjoyed this video. 
Thank you to my Patreon supporters and thank you for listening.